The following research is part of the National Institute for Congestion Reduction funded by the United States Department of Transportation through the University Transportation Center program. Learn more at www.nicr.usf.edu. Welcome to Out of My Lane, a podcast of the Center for Urban Transportation Research at the University of South Florida in Tampa. I'm Wayne Garcia, your host for this podcast, which is about all things transportation and how to get from point A to point B safely and without losing your mind. Always uh, a tough question in transportation. Today, we want to talk about self-driving vehicles, autonomous vehicles. I know you've seen them in the science fiction movies, and now some of them are out on the streets today. They're being uh, piloted, perfected, all of those kind of things. And with me today from the Center for Urban Transportation Research, or Cutter, are two of their scientists and researchers who are working on those matters both separately from, but also as part of the NICER program that is out there, the National Institute for Congestion Reduction, which USF administers that program for a number of universities that are involved. With me today are Dr. Cicinho Conkis. Uh, Dr. Conkis, welcome. Thank you. And Dr. Shaw Lee. Shaw, good to have you back. Thanks. They have worked both separately and together on various research studies dealing with these kind of vehicles. Dr. Conkis is a program manager at Cutter, and he runs the Autonomous Connected Mobility Evaluation Group program, ACME, for those out there keeping track of the acronyms. And uh, Dr. Lee is actually the director of the NICER program and grant and is the founder of the Connected and Autonomous Transportation Systems Lab. That's CATS for those keeping track. So we've got NICER, ACME, CATS, and Cutter out there. There will be a test at the end of the podcast for all you listeners. Thank you so much for coming and being part of our discussion as we talk about autonomous vehicles. So let me start off with, because we talked a little bit before we came on microphone about what's the difference between an autonomous vehicle and a connected autonomous vehicle, Cicinho? Sure. I will let Dr. Lee elaborate a little bit more on the autonomous vehicles. Perhaps you probably have discussed this in previous podcasts, but in terms of connected vehicles, these are uh, it is a technology that allows vehicles to communicate with each other and with the surrounding infrastructure. The communication happens over the air. Vehicles can communicate using their own language. Think of that as English for us right now. So we can talk and acquire information. This information is very useful when exchanged between vehicles and the infrastructure to prevent both accidents and improve the flow of the vehicles on uh, the road network. So we will be talking in detail how the communication happens through this discussion. I gotcha. And so, Dr. Lee, the autonomous vehicles, they would seem to be like, to me, I would think, oh, these are all the same, but they're not. They're really different skill sets that the vehicles need to have than a connected system. So talk about autonomous vehicles. What does that category mean? Yeah. As Sassanil mentioned, uh, connected vehicles are about communications, whereas autonomous vehicles are about vehicle control. So we're talking about uh, the regular vehicles that we are driving. So it's basically each vehicle needs a human driver, whereas an autonomous vehicle is essentially to replace the human driver with a robot driver. You're going to have computers to control the autonomous vehicles, and you're going to have sensors uh, equipped to perceive the surrounding environment, uh, and you're going to have actuators and uh, automated mechanical control to drive the vehicle. So that's uh, ultimately about uh, what an an autonomous vehicle is. It's basically using a robot driver to replace a human driver. So is it fair to say one piece of this study, the connected piece, is how the vehicle connects to the rest of the world? So when I first started researching for this podcast, 
I was like connected. Are they like physically connected? Are we talking like a train of cars? No, it's the connection to the data in the world. That's right. And I think this is probably in the future when we will have these, uh, hopefully, uh, autonomous vehicles on the road, they will also be connected. They will be self-driving, uh, but will be communicating with each other and also with the surrounding infrastructure. So a communication means exchange of information, mostly it's data. Currently, the connected vehicles, they exchange position, speed information, heading, all sorts of uh, information related to their movement on the road. The communication happens because there are devices that they broadcast over the air using high frequency signal, this information. Uh, nearby vehicles, they can start and engage in this communication. And along the road, and this is happening across the US and the world at large, there are also investments, large investments in infrastructure in terms of having other devices installed at intersections along the road that can broadcast information from the vehicle to the vehicles. And also vehicles can relay this information back to these boxes. Altogether, putting a framework for an ecosystem where in the future, when we will have autonomous vehicles, information will happen seamlessly and very efficiently. Yeah, I hadn't thought about it this way, but the autonomous vehicles that are out being tested on the road today, they don't talk to each other. They're like independent players. They're trying to sense the world as they individually see it. So they're trying to figure out, is that light red or green? Where's the curb? Where's my turn lane? That, that, that kind of thing. So then the next level is to connect them so everyone can talk and understand like you're going to be coming up and the light's changing instead of trying to sense that the light's changing. It, it, it is correct. It is correct. I think that Dr. Lee can elaborate because he has done a lot of work in terms of uh, autonomous vehicles and uh, developments in terms of the sensors that are used to obtain this information. And when we speak about sensors in vehicle sensor, for example, reading uh, lane marks on the road, but in terms of connected vehicles, the information can also be broadcasted, for example, by uh, these roadside units at intersections. Then they can broadcast information on the timing of the signal, the layout of the intersection, everything digital. The connected vehicles absorb this information over the air, they can process, and they can compensate for some of the shortcomings of their own sensors, like the capacity of reading an intersection color of uh, the signal, signal that could be red, but in front of the signal, you could have the sun coming up and providing a problem to the camera or other sensor capacity to read the color of that light. Using information instead broadcasted by the intersection directly to the vehicle would provide a more seamless and efficient way of uh, obtaining this information. So then going back to the autonomous vehicles, Dr. Lee, how much do they need to know? I'm thinking now in terms of sensing, processing, understanding, that's got to be really complex. Yes. Yeah, so do you mean uh, how much do they need to do the autonomous vehicles need to perceive? Is that a question? Yeah. Like how many things are going on inside an autonomous vehicle in terms of its ability to navigate a roadway? It's not just some kind of scanning and stay between the lanes. There's so much more going on. Give our listeners a sense of com the complexity of getting that. Yeah, sure. So I want to make an analogy to human drivers. Think about, uh, we all know, like when we drive, what we do and what uh, organs of our body we need to use. First of all, we probably want to use our eyes to see the uh, situations around. Sometimes we want to use our ears to hear sirens and honks, that kind of thing. So these are like our perception organs. And there will be like equivalent uh, components in autonomous vehicles about uh, perception. We have camera sensors just to like our eyes, and they may have more advanced sensors using LiDAR, radar, uh, you know, um, uh, and other techniques that can perceive um, faster and potentially better than human uh, eyes. And next, when we drive, after we perceive the surrounding information, we need to identify which ones are objects, which ones are human beings, what, where is my rights of land, and that kind of thing. So um, our brain is going to work. And then we, according to that, we're going to decide the driving decision of autonomous vehicles. And that's where the computer component, as well as the complicated software, some of that is related to artificial intelligence, is for. 
So you do complicated data analytics to recognize the objects and classify them into different types, and then make the driving this decide which a space is drivable and what route or pass I need to follow. And next, think about as a human driver, we want to use our hands and feet to execute the decisions, right? Steering the drive, steering wheels, and also step on the gas or brake pedals. So autonomous vehicles also have that functions with automated control. We can convert the computer control signals into the very fast reacting mechanical controls to execute uh, the control decisions to follow the plan pass. Yeah, that's about overview of the autonomous vehicle functions. You can really just think autonomous vehicles as you know robot driver that has pretty much equivalent body functions as a human driver. Now, you have one of these vehicles, uh, correct? We have them uh, in our lab. And uh, so you've ridden in one. Tell us, what is that like? Yeah, actually, I, I feel like I enjoy it. It's it's cool. You're going to see like, vehicles drive themselves. And uh, of course, we put a driver behind the wheels to control the vehicle just in case something happens. But uh, most of the time, it functions pretty well. You can. Uh, it's pretty cool. And yeah, and, and when I especially when I wave to people with my hands <laughs> uh, open and uh, hands up. And that, that looks pretty cool. And also, uh, it's actually not... Uh, driving behavior is very smooth. We actually did lots of work to adjust the vehicle's uh, controllability and comfortness. And, and therefore, actually, the driving pattern. Actually, it's uh, better than a good driver. You feel like the public has some level of a split to it of people who go, wow, this is great. I can't wait. And others who are like, I will never not be in control of my car. That sort of gets us into the behavioral questions. And Dr. Kunkus, I know your training is in uh, economics. And so you look at a lot of the things that you're looking at for uh, these research studies in terms of wants, needs, human behaviors even. Yeah, definitely. As a training of an economist, uh, it's based on uh, the study of human behavior, rationalizing uh, decisions. Why do you make such decisions and for what purposes and ultimately what, the, what is the outcome? In the case of transportation, the demand for transport, it is an indirect demand. So we end up using vehicles or whatever mode to get from A to B, either to uh, pick up somebody or to acquire goods or services. So the element of economics plays a great role in terms of studying human behavior. But I would like to bring it back to what, in terms of the realm of uh, our work of uh, research work, autonomous and connected vehicles. In, uh, in the case of Qatar, for example, for the last four to five years, we have uh, engaged in uh, large and complex studies of human behavior as it pertains to uh, connected vehicles. The Tampa downtown is a very lively area, it's growing very fast and happens to be one of the three sites in the United States where the largest scale deployment of connected vehicle has been happening for the last five years. We have the Tampa Eastboro Expressway Authority, or THEA, because we have a THEA downtown Tampa, CV pilot. We, at one point in time, have recruited up to 1,000 participants and equipped their vehicles with connected vehicle technology. The exchange of information between vehicles happens at a very high frequency, to ensure that safety is retained. And when I say high frequency, it's up to 10 times per second. So when you think about studying behavior relying on a panel of 1,000 individuals over the course of two, three years, the amount of information to be processed is humongous in the order of billions and billions of observations. This is the work of Carter in terms of analyzing ultimately and understand what are, if any, constancies in terms of human uh, behavior as the, these participants behind the wheels are exposed to connected vehicle technologies? The human behavior, what we have found through the study of connected vehicles, bear in mind that the connected vehicle technology allows to provide information directly to the drivers behind the wheels. And in the case of the CSCV pilot, this happens through, by way of a human machine interface by displaying information on the rear view mirror. So what we have done, we have started studying, and we've been doing this for the last five years in terms of understanding what happens when individuals are 
receiving information that is relevant as they move through the transportation network. Does their behavior change? Or if it doesn't, why? And this is what we've been doing basically for the last five years. And uh, it's a, a very stimulating and challenging field of work. Do we know anything yet, even preliminarily, about their behaviors change with this information or not? How much more does this study have to go in terms of really mining that data? Sure. We have found that uh, in some of the connected vehicle applications, there, is, there are really relevant in terms of ensuring increased safety to uh, travelers in the system. There is a positive response as the the humans, uh, uh, travelers, digest this information provided by the collective, uh, connected vehicles. They can, in, in, in one of the, uh, probably the most important applications that rely heavily on connected vehicle technology, it is the electronic uh, emergency brake light. So you're in a stream of traffic, there's a lot of vehicles in front of you, and this is probably a striking difference so far with respect to autonomous vehicles, which is always, the autonomous vehicles is scanning for the nearby environment. But when there are cars in front of you, it could be a few hundred feet, and there is an, a car ahead of you, you don't see that car. But if the car is connected, it's transmitting signals. And if the car is in distress and is having, by distress, a conflict with another vehicles, that information can be digested by your vehicles. You might be distracted, but you have enough time, if you receive that warning on your rear view mirror, to take proper action. So we found out that participants in this study using these connected vehicle applications, they ended up increasing the safety of the road sections where these applications have been deployed in downtown Tampa. Wow, that, that, that's just amazing. And how do these two researches then come together? Ultimately, does connected vehicles then obviate the need for some of the sensing and computing ability, or we really need both, and we're both moving down the track at the same time? Sure. So I think... Uh... In my opinion, if they can get married, the world will be better. I think you can have connectivity alone or have automation alone, but ultimately I think that if they work together, it's going to be better. For example, with automation, the connected information communication could be a lot more complicated and richer than human drivers. Our human drivers, if we drive connected vehicles because of the limits of the human beings, we can only process so much information. If it's more than that, it could be a distraction. But think about the computers. They can process like megabytes of data in a split of a second. And, they can, and with that, you can expand the communication bandwidth of connected vehicles and take a greater benefit of that. From the automation point of view, if you only have automation, you can only make decisions, like Cecilio said, based on uh, what you just immediately perceive. That's just a few vehicles around you. But... If you have a connected vehicle information, like you can see further, you can see after the vehicles that block your view mm -hmm. and you can see miles down, there is going to be an incident. Okay, there is going to be a, a signal light that's going to turn red and half mile down the road, things like that. So with that, automation will make a much better decision and that can improve the mobility, reduce the energy consumption emissions and much improve safety. Dr. Kunkus, you mentioned how Tampa has a very good system, especially downtown, of these connections, these things that have been put into place to tell vehicles things, and then ultimately to tell a driver or to tell an autonomous vehicle. It could be either way. How embracing is our local governments at this point to really building these into transportation systems that, that this connectivity is out there. Are we at just at the start of doing this, embracing this, or are we further along than most people realize? I think uh, distinguishing between states within the United States are large. Uh, there's a lot of heterogeneity differences, but we are in Florida, and I think we're on the forefront in terms of uh, now that uh, the latest technologies and uh, the state of Florida is very active. So they've been embracing changes in technology for quite a few years now. And I think both in the realm of autonomous and connected vehicles. There are some challenges for agencies in terms of the infrastructure necessary to implement connected vehicle technology. Although the more you deploy, the more on average 
you think that there are economic efficiency in terms of lowering the unit cost of the infrastructure necessary for connected vehicle technology to be deployed on a large scale. In the case of Tampa, the agencies are very well open. There's a lot of communication between uh, the different partners and stakeholders in, in terms of those managing the road network. For the state, as the entire state of Florida, both Dr. Lee and I, for example, are working on a larger scale deployment, this I-4 or Interstate 4 frame network, which sees the deployment of connected and potentially also autonomous connected vehicle technology in the future, a tapestry of connected vehicle infrastructure between here in Tampa and all the way to uh, and past and well beyond Orlando. And that in the next few years will mean a lot in terms of uh, what we expect. And as Dr. Lee was mentioning, the different benefits associated with this technology, which on the forefront and the most importantly are in terms of safety, but also the efficient movement of goods and people in the state and the ancillary benefits that come from efficiency and reduction accidents, which are environmental and uh, energy related as well. And that's interesting. You bring up not just individual use, but the commercial use. Do you see the commercial industries, the trucking industry adopting these kinds of solutions before the public at large does? Do we know anything about what that might look like in terms of embracing? I'm going to focus on the connected element, which is a lot of the work that I do. And I think Dr. Lin can elaborate in terms of freight autonomous vehicles, which is a very interesting and fast developing realm of work in terms of the private sector taking care of or scaling up the deployment of autonomous vehicles as it pertains to freight movement. But in terms of also autonomous connected uh, vehicle technology related to the movement of heavy vehicles, yes, it is very important because the, the connected vehicle technology can allow the freight trucks to di digest information from nearby infrastructure and move a little bit more seamlessly. For example, you're approaching a, a, an arterial which is uh, layered with several intersections. If these intersections, each one of them equipped with a light, can give a little bit more priority considering all the other vehicles. It could be emergency vehicles and so forth, but a freight vehicle approaching the intersection can ask a little bit more priority in terms of going by and extending the green light so that at the very end, it can get from A to B a little faster. And that will mean a lot for us in terms of having uh, goods moving a little bit more seamlessly in the network. That happens for freight. It can happen for public transportation, definitely. But it's an area of work that, it, that, that is fast developing. And I think in terms of the movement of uh, heavy vehicles relying on autonomous technology, there's a lot going on. Has the driver shortage and the whole supply chain issue driven more interest in trucking companies that say, wow, this would be really cool to have no driver shortage? Yes, that could be a factor. Basically, if you know the cost structure of the freight industry, driver costs are a significant component. If uh, they could uh, reduce or completely eliminate that portion of the cost, the freight industry can benefit a lot. And uh, potentially, you could do that uh, by automating the vehicle. There is some transition of technology. Some are referred as platooning or uh connected uh, adaptive cruise control. But these basically mean that trucks, they can sort of a, via communication and automation, they can follow each other autonomously with the smaller gaps. And uh, uh, some uh, current technologies, just having one drive in the lead truck, it can guide the several autonomous trucks without driver and along a long haul. Uh, transportation journey. And, and in the future, they envision that they will make all these uh, tr tracks autonomous, and that way they can potentially completely eliminate uh, the dri driver cost and uh, worry of a driver shortage, possibly. But of course, there is going to be another issue of the workforce impact to the driver. That, uh, track drivers are a significant uh, sector of uh, workforce uh, in our society and uh, how to take care of them after that is going to become an issue. We should be mindful for, uh, for that as well. So what's the timetable here? I'll ask each of you because you're, you're in connected but separate fields. What's the timetable for widespread appearance of connections for vehicles, driver or driverless, and the timetable for 
seeing a substantial number of self-driving vehicles. I'll start with Dr. Lee first. Uh, how far is the future away on this? Yeah, that, that's a good question, but I don't have the crystal ball. But what I can tell you is a little bit of the history. Back in 1930s, people were predicting that by the year of 1960s, all the vehicle fleets would be autonomous by that time. We did have some ups and downs along the journey. We did uh, complete, uh, accomplish great uh, technology advance from the 1930s to 1960s, but the vehicles were, were apparently not uh, fully automated. So there would be some hypes and uh, high hopes uh, driven by either good wishes from the uh, academia or the industry interests, right? The venture invest companies. We're going to see different uh, predictions of the timelines. Um, but I would say that it's a variable and it depends on what we do here, actually. What governments do in the next uh, 10 years or 20 years will impact its timeline. And what uh, uh, we as researchers do, maybe what uh, Dr. Kunkas and uh, Carter, Nicer do, may have also a minor impact to this process as well. And what you do as a podcast host, uh, hoster could also have an impact after people hear this uh, episode and maybe they all uh, think more of getting into this uh, field and this realm to advance the technology. But low-level automations are already there. It's, it happened, uh, and I think uh, maybe in, in Earth, uh, it, it's widely happened in... Oh, yeah, we have lane assist yeah. and yeah. emergency side. We have a lot of things that are starting to be built into every single vehicle. Just like Dr. Conkus, on your timeline for fully connected vehicles, we're somewhat connected now. If I go on Waze, it's going to tell me, oh, there's there's a train crossing here. You should slow down. Or there's a police officer ahead. You should definitely slow down. So what's the timeline for that? I think that, and I'm going to relate it to our specific deployment, the most current phase that we have in downtown Tampa, simply because we're engaging with the OEMs, the original equipment manufacturers, specifically we're working closely with uh, Toyota, Hyundai, and uh, Honda in the deployment of uh, connected vehicle technologies. Now, the different car makers in this instance, their vehicles, they are communicating with each other. So they're starting to speak the same language, which I think is a substantial evolution in terms of the widespread adoption of one way of communicating between different car makers. So that means that if, uh, and this is coupled with uh, Dr. Lee comments about the regulatory framework, the changes that are in the horizon will be substantial, then there will be a faster adoption of this technology. Because we're, in terms of the technology itself, we're really quite well ahead, both in terms of autonomous and connected vehicle technology. But the regulatory framework plays a key role in here. Uh, we are in the midst, as it pertains to connected vehicle technology, of waiting for a resolution from the Federal Communication Commission regarding the exchange of information between vehicles, the rules. Uh, clarity is obtained. Hopefully by the end of this year, then that will mean that the OEMs will effect effectively make a strate strategic decision in terms of commercializing on their own vehicles this technology. So right now we might have a, a small scale deployment and acceptance, but it's like breaking the ice. Once it happens, it happens. Yeah, I just want to add that low level automations, as I mentioned earlier, are already there, right? Many of you already drive vehicles with uh, like autopilot. Uh, they can follow the preceding vehicle and they can keep you in the same lane or sometimes they can do some cool maneuvers like lane changes. These are already level one and level two automations. And uh, recently, if you watch news, you might uh, see that uh, Mercedes-Benz would uh, issue a level three automated vehicle. And they probably, in this May, they're going to start to operate that uh, in Germany. That's already level three. And then there is only going to be level four and level five to go to reach the highest level of automation. So I'm still very hopeful despite uh, the ups and downs of the history. And I, it's just like stock market. It grows uh, in the long run. The overall picture is growing, but it has ups and downs if you're looking to a particular time frame. Well, excellent. Gentlemen, we're at the end of this episode. We could talk forever because these are really things that people, once they hear this, they're going to realize how much 
their feet are already in this new world and what's coming. And it's not one of those things where they'll say, in my lifetime, I'll see this. No, I think sooner than later, obviously. So again, Cicinho Conkis and Shaw Lee from the Center for Urban Transportation Research, and both of them researchers on the NICER program trying to reduce congestion, make us all safer on the roadways. Thank you for joining us. I'm your host, Wayne Garcia. We'll see you at the next podcast. The National Institute for Congestion Reduction, NICR, is a transportation research center focused on innovative congestion strategies. The center is composed of researchers from the University of South Florida, the University of California, Berkeley, Texas A&M University, and the University of Puerto Rico at Mayagüez, and funded by the United States Department of Transportation. For more information, please visit www.nicr.usf.edu.